Thanks a lot. Um, I've already learned so much this morning, I'm grateful to be here. Um, just to kick off, first word that comes to mind when you hear the word patterns. Anyway. Sorry? Control. Sorry? Leather. Leather. <laughs> okay, cool. That's, that was just a kind of a thought experiment that I just want to run just so that I've got a little piece of paper here written already of words that I thought would come up. I think I've been doing this job too long. Um, so, you know, we've heard a lot about the Constitution, we've heard a lot about John Locke. I just want to quickly run through some of those things just for anybody who's unfamiliar with intellectual property patterns. Um, so the US Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, is where patents really come into being as a form of property. Um, it says to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to uh, authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And I think the word discovery is quite interesting because when we think about the times that this was written, when we think about the John Locke theory of property, which is embedded in colonialism, and his idea of this was a free land that could be taken and discovered and appropriated. It's just interesting to think that intellectual property is embedded in those principles because you can read any IP text, and I'm not talking people who've done anthropology or study IP critically, but read any IP text, and this aspect of intellectual property is totally omitted. I mean, I'm a practitioner, I come from the law, I sit with people at Stanford, people who've written justifying intellectual property, and they write about John Locke ad nauseum. And there's not one word about colonialism in there. So I just want to set that standard because it comes around again shortly as I go through my talk. So now it's useful to think about also intellectual property in at least in the United States because some have argued that it democratized invention. Uh, when we think about in France or Britain, uh, that patents were grants of privilege from the monarch uh, or the monarchy only to wealthy elites. Whereas here in the United States, you could actually pay a pretty modest fee and you could actually sort of become an inventor. And so in that way, some have said that the patent system in the United States was the first sort of democratization of invention and democratization of property. Again, I'll, I'll circle back to that shortly because I feel we've kind of moved away from that quite significantly. Now, you know, again, for those who are not familiar with patents, you know, the social contract of the modern patent system is, you know, you invent something or you discover, because a lot of science is serendipity, and scientists may not like me saying that, but you get a lot of patents that are just, oh shit, I'm surprised. Um, now, you know, you just want to get for a limited time, uh, it's to encourage and reward investment. And, you know, the diffusion of knowledge, that these patents are made public, you can actually search them on the patent databases. You might not know what the hell they're talking about, but the apparently you can search them. That's what the patent office likes to call transparency, but it's not really. Um, now, because, in my opinion, patents are premised, or one of the principles, is premised on invention. You know, it says to invent something. But this is, this, you know, this invention is basically set, and you know, some of our speakers have already talked about how the law is malleable. Uh, it's, it's, it's a legal fiction. It's a, it's a test of what is new, what is obvious, what is, what is, what is something that has been actually written in an enabling way. But what if a lot of inventions are actually obvious? These things that we decide that are inventive, you know, the patent office gives you a stamp, gives you a certificate, and says, you know, this is inventive. And I want to quote a, a High Court judge from the United Kingdom, uh, Sir Hugh Laddie, who actually was probably one of the smartest lawyers that, uh, judges that I've ever probably come across. And I think anybody in the intellectual property fraternity might not mean anything to you guys, but for those of us who've been in this business, he was very well regarded. And he was controversial. And he wrote a seminal piece called What's Invention Got to Do With It? And his whole point was that actually, he was actually, he was all about the patent system. His whole point was that basically, we need the patent system to drive investment. Otherwise, we're going to get these medicines or these other things. Companies wouldn't take the risk or so forth, or inventors wouldn't take the risk. So if that's the case, I take that point a little bit further. But if everything is obvious, then do we have a patent system? Is it really a investment system? Is it really where those who have the capital and the wealth can actually acquire property by basically applying for these patents? And I think that's where we are today. We literally have a falsehood. And I think, 
you know, we've heard various words thrown around, and I'll get to it, you know, towards the end of my talk. But I think, you know, the word innovation has brainwashed us. Because that is the basis of why we're giving away so much. So much extraction is happening in terms of the intellectual property system. Because we think it's progress. You know, it reminds me of a great quote by the historian Jill Lepore, who said, you know, the world is getting worse and worse, but our devices are getting newer and newer. <laughs> um, now, I want to come to the second piece of, like, you know, this ownership issue. And I think the COVID crisis was a great example for those of us who worked on trying to get accessible vaccines away to people in the global south. Now, for those of you who don't know and are not familiar, the World Trade Organization, which governs the global intellectual property system, it really essentially globalized the intellectual property system, the World Trade Organization. It's just as old as Justin Bieber. It's about 27 years old, <laughs> believe it or not. You think, it's, you think it's old. Many people hadn't heard of the World Trade Organization, but it's actually pretty young. But this is what globalized intellectual property. Many countries in the global south didn't want this property system. They fought against it, they did not want it, but neo-colonialism and neoliberalism enforced it upon them. And today, they were the ones who were left behind. Almost 2.5 billion people didn't get the vaccines. For various reasons, but because intellectual property played a huge role. It denied people the ability to manufacture their own vaccines. You had two companies, Moderna and Pfizer, who literally stepped ahead, claimed all the sort of rights, and now are fighting with so many other companies actually because nobody knows who owns it. But they got ahead and the United States government was responsible for that. It was all about America first. So it's important to realize that these systems are not just United States, you know, Europe. These have been globalized and they affect people in many different ways. And this is happening on newer technologies. We've got this huge debate going on in the psychedelics industry. Traditional knowledge. Communities that have actually been using psychedelics for years and now all of a sudden, Basically, oh, we need investment. And you know, there's this great case by it's called Diamond Chakrabarti that says you can patent anything made by man under the sun. And this is the principle that really follows, you know, this discovery idea. And I think this is hugely problematic. Artificial intelligence, and I'm sure that people here who are far more uh, sort of knowledgeable about artificial intelligence and where it's going. But at least from a patent practitioner's point of view, there's, there's two possible ways. One, it could actually really upend the system by saying that everything is obvious because the way these systems work. Or we could actually end up with a system whereby we're getting proliferation of patterns even more so than we ever have. And I fear that is what's gonna happen because we are so, so, so obsessed with innovation. But it's nothing really, it's nothing new. And so, coming to a few solutions, I think ultimately, you know, having spent a lot of time on the Hill speaking to Congress people and policy and policy wonks and what have you, I think it's important. But I think what's really important is language. You know, I think it was the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei said we need a new language. And we do need a new language to talk about how we talk about these systems. Because for me, the way we talk about innovation is actually at the crux and heart of all this stuff. Because, you know, this idea of progress. It's not progress. It's just more capital, more wealth, more power to a few. And I think we need to understand that. And I think also, um, one thing we need to do, and we have the opportunity to, people are starting to wake up. So, you know, I'm not going to jump straight to say, let's get rid of the intellectual property system or the patent system. But I think we can shrink it immensely by really saying, actually, you know, what is at least new by a different legal standard to come to the point of the laws are malleable. We create our own boundaries. This is all legal fiction. We make it up every day. And in fact, the people who make it up are the ones with the lobby money. They go to Congress and they say how we want to define these laws. And I think finally, you know, when we come to actually so I think it was Matt who said, Fox in the hen house. We think about these government rights. Look at all the government funding that went to these vaccines and all these other fundings that go into at least the pharmaceutical space. We have no say in that. Maybe a little bit more of a participatory democracy in terms of actually how we decide how those inventions or how that R&D gets used and where and for what price. Thank you.